Senator Cormann. President, Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator, Bur Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time this week. Uh, from Monday 24 to Thursday 27 February uh, 2020 due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment and the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment. And Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Education and the Minister for Decentralisation and Regional Education. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Will the Prime Minister convene a national summit that brings together governments, advocates, service providers and survivors to help this nation address the scourge of family violence? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Keneally uh, for that uh, question. I can inform the Senate uh, that uh, Minister Payne, the Minister for Women, uh, is convening a meeting of all uh, women's uh, safety uh, ministers next week. Uh, this will be a very uh, important meeting, accelerating the work already underway. Uh, and then in the following week, uh, the Council of Australian Governments uh, will be updated on the work that has been undertaken as part of the fourth action plan of the national plan uh, to reduce violence against women and their children. Um, this is all work uh, this is all work we do in partnership, of course, and alongside the state and territory governments who are on the front line in relation uh, to uh, this uh, issue. This is also this has, of course, been a bipartisan uh, initiative uh, all the way through, and, and I again acknowledge uh, that uh, this work to establish the first action plan uh, commenced under the Rudd uh, and Gillard governments. Um, so that's. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Will the Prime Minister also make it easier for women to escape violent and abusive relationships by refunding defunded advocacy services and improving access to the social security system? Senator Cormann. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, thanks, Senator Keneally, for that supplementary question. We will continue, uh, as we have done, uh, to work in a nonpartisan fashion. Uh, with um, all of the state and territory governments in relation to, to these issues to ensure uh, that appropriate funding uh, is uh, provided. And, and indeed, I mean, in my statement a little earlier, I did point out the very significant funding that has been uh, put in place during our period in government uh, to address uh, this uh, uh, terrible issue. I mean, the government's first priority is to keep Australians safe. Combating violence against women and children is, uh, of course, central uh, to that objective. Uh, women have the right to be safe in their homes, in their communities, in their workplaces and online. And since 2013, the Commonwealth has committed $840 million to address domestic and uh, family violence and will continue, as I say, to work with all of the state and territory governments uh, to further uh, build on the work that's already been done. Senator Keneally, a final Thank supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Question. President. Will the Prime Minister make it easier for women to escape violent and abusive relationships by providing more safe places for women and children to stay and including paid family violence leave in national employment standards? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, the government will uh, continue to work uh, with state and territory governments uh, through all these <coughs> issues and uh, you know, make, continue to make decisions uh, uh, as appropriate. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate on why the government's approach to domestic and family violence is one of zero tolerance? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Askew for her question. I think uh, we heard uh, by the remarks of leaders in the chamber uh, prior to question time uh, that this is a very difficult matter to, uh, to speak of. Uh, given the events of last week. Uh, we all learned of the tragedy Camp Hill with horror, with great sadness. I know colleagues across the government, across the parliament, are also grappling with this appalling event and trying to understand uh, how something like this can happen. And it is important that we do continue to reflect on it and to talk about it and that we do act on it. Our government believes that one death 
of a woman or a child, the hands of a partner or a father is one too many. Our unequivocal goal is to reduce family violence mm -hmm. and to eliminate it. It is, as colleagues have said, unacceptable that a woman is killed every week in Australia by a partner. Mr President, language is important. We can't tolerate public language that trivialises or distorts the reality of domestic violence. Each murder, each act of domestic violence is an individual atrocity. There is no betrayal so detestable as an act of violence against the people who we are supposed to love and care for. For Hannah Clark and her three children, Aaliyah, Liana and Trey, who had a right to be safe in their home and in their neighbourhood, <coughs> all women and children in Australia have that right. As a community, as a parliament, we must redouble our efforts to keep women and children safe. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on what the government is doing to eliminate violence against women and children? Senator Payne. We know, Mr President, that eliminating domestic violence takes sustained long-term action, including primary prevention and early intervention, and they are both focuses of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children 2010-2022. As Minister Cormann indicated, as part of the fourth action plan, the Commonwealth is investing considerably $340 million in frontline services to protect and support women and children. That includes funding for training 18,500 frontline workers, providing safe places for women and children affected by violence, and support for the 1800 Respect line. In the second half of, of last year, I have taken the opportunity to convene at least five, I think, round tables on family and domestic violence. Uh, held three women's safety ministers meeting with meetings with Minister Rustin, hearing directly from survivors and from practitioners, and to progress Order, this action across Australia. Um, Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate of what more governments, individuals, and communities can do to prevent the scourge of domestic violence? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And to be very clear, we know that there is more to do. But we also know that to bring about the further change needed, we do need collaboration and commitment from governments, from the community, from individuals. I spoke this morning with my state colleague, Di Farmer, in Queensland, the uh, Minister for Child Safety, Youth and Women, and Minister for the Protection of Domestic and Family Violence, about our work together. In the wake of Camp Hill, we'll consider what additional pro approaches we do need to take, including access to mental health services to support both victims and people at risk of perpetrating violence. I will work on that with my counterpart, women's safety ministers. We must all work to eradicate perverse attitudes that lead to control, to manipulation, to abuse and ultimately to violence within families. That is a task for all of us. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister confirm that the National Farmers Federation Roadmap 2030 includes the goal of Australian agriculture achieving carbon neutrality by 2030? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Yes, I can. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. In October 2019, the Prime Minister endorsed the National Farmers Federation roadmap, declaring, and I quote, a bold vision, but it's an achievable one. Does the Morrison government continue to fully support the NFF's roadmap and their goal of being carbon neutral by 2030? Senator Rustin. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator McAllister, for your question. Um, Certainly, um, the bold vision of the National Farmers Federation in uh, targeting a goal of 20 uh, to uh, zero by 2050 uh, is something that the, the, the Tw sorry, 2030. My apologies. By 2030, um, as you can see, uh, obviously I'm not working off any notes here. Um, but the National yeah. Farmers Federation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, 
thank, thank you very much, Senator McAllister, for your question, and a very important question about the contribution that agriculture is prepared to make, along with other businesses around this country, towards making sure that we have a future, a clean uh, energy future. And one of the things that uh, the one uh, that the, um, the Nationals Farmers order. Federation, Senator Rustin, Senator McAllister, on a point of order. Uh, my point of order goes to relevance. The question asked whether the NFF's roadmap was supported by government, and in particular whether their goal of being carbon neutral by 2030 was supported. I'd like an answer and a response on that. You've reminded the minister of the question, Senator McAllister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator McAllister, for your uh, for your um, confirmation of your question. Um, the roadmap, the, the, the towards 2030 roadmap of the of the National Farmers Federation, is a roadmap of the National Farmers Federation. Order, Senator There's Rustin. Time for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister. A final Thanks, supplementary Mr. President. Question. In addition to the National Farmers Federation, can the minister confirm that a net zero emissions by 2050 target has been endorsed by the Business Council of Australia, the CSIRO, oh. the Australian Academy of Science, the Property Council of Australia, the AI Group, the, the Grattan Institute, BHP Qantas, the Commonwealth Bank, Telstra, AGL Origin, and Energy Australia? That's quite a lot. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much. Um, and Order. in my capacity as the as the representative of the Minister for, for Agriculture, um, I, can, I can advise the Chamber um, of the commitment made by the National Farmers Federation in terms of their roadmap towards uh, 2030. But what I would say is that, along with many industries around Australia, we thank the National uh, Farmers Federation for their commitment towards reducing emissions. As we all know, agri the agricultural sector is a sector that has been constantly criticised for their high emissions. So we would thank the, the National Farmers Federation for that commitment. But the Morrison government has made it very, very clear that whatever we do towards reducing carbon emissions into the future will be responsible. We will be responsible in terms of environmentally effective and it will also be economically Order. responsible. And we will make sure that we do not commit the Australian public to something that we do not know the price of. Order. Order. I'm about to call the next question. Order. Senator Molan. Order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Left. President. Thank you. Order. Thank you, Mr. President, and, and uh, my, my thanks goes to the opposition for such a welcome. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, Mr. President, can the uh, my question is for the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the future submarine program will deliver for Australia's national interest? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I thank Senator Molan for his question and also for his unwavering commitment to Australian defence and defence capability. I am very proud that the Morrison government is firmly committed to Australia's national security, to keeping Australians safe and also creating more jobs for Australian workers. That's why the Morrison government is building the future submarines right here in Australia with Australian workers and with Australian steel. On this side of the chamber, we understand that our future submarines are essential capability for Australian defence. And unlike those opposite, we are acquiring this new capability. Last week, I met with the French Defence Minister, Florence Parley, and we discussed the ongoing implementation of the Future Submarine Program, which is currently in the preliminary design phase. This was a productive meeting with both Australia and France mutually reaffirming our full commitment to the program, but also acknowledging the key role it plays in understanding and uh, underpinning our growing strategic partnership. Minister Parley was absolutely crystal clear in her commitment and support for an an ambitious target to maximise Australian industry capability and for meeting project milestones. We will, personally, we will personally meet quarterly to monitor cost and schedule this year to ensure that the next milestone due in January 2021 is met. The delivery of the Future Submarine Program is a hugely ambitious and complex program. This is why we have been tough in our negotiations in finalising the strategic partnering agreement and we have implemented a robust fit-for-purpose risk management framework to get this critical capability right. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate what measures the Morrison government is taking to maximise Australian industry capacity in the future submarine program? Senator Reynolds. Thanks Order. very much. 
Um, Mr. President, and again I thank Senator Molan for the question. Maximising Australian industry capability is a key objective of the future submarine program. All 12 of the attack class submarines will be built in Australia as part of this government's continuous naval shipbuilding program. We are deliberately progressing the preliminary zero. Uh, we are deliberately progressing the preliminary design of the submarine. This work, once complete, will form the basis for maximising opportunities for Australian companies in the program for many decades to come. What we will do now is to set up Australian businesses for success in the future. To date, around 1,600 Australian companies have registered interest in the program. Naval Group Australia has issued 3,579 requests for information to around 1,500 Australian suppliers. Now, this is only the beginning of what will be a once-in-a-generation opportunity for Australian industry and Australian workers. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to Australia's submarine and shipbuilding program? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And Senator Molan, unfortunately, I am all too aware. The contrast between the coalition and the Labor's record on naval shipbuilding could not be starker. Defence was an unacceptable casualty of Labor's appalling economic and budget management. Defence spending fell to 1.56 per cent of GDP in the 2012-13 budget, the lowest level of a defence expenditure since 1938, with $18 billion ripped out of defence. Labor's, Labor delayed the program to replace Navy's Collin class submarines, risking a capability gap. In six years, in six years, Labor did not commission a single Australian-built naval vessel. The shipbuilding valley of death was Labor's own valley of death. Those opposition harp on about local content, but I can, let me remind you that 100 per cent of zero, which is your record, is still zero. Order. By Senator contrast, Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Waters. Order. Senator Waters is on her feet. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Attorney General, uh, Minister Order. Payne. Order. Sorry, I'd like to hear Senator Waters' question. Sorry, start again, Senator Waters. I couldn't hear it. Senator Waters, please Thanks. start again. Thanks, President. My question is to the minister representing the Attorney General, uh, Senator, Senator uh, Payne. Frontline domestic violence crisis services have said for years that women and children are being turned away from essential services due to lack of funding. The beds are full. The crisis phone lines can't all be answered when they ring, and that women are being forced to choose between violence and homelessness. This government's DV funding is not enough. It's not protecting sufferers from family violence. How many more women and children need to be killed before this government will treat this as domestic terrorism and as the real national security crisis and put the $5 billion over 10 years? that's needed for frontline services and primary prevention. The Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I acknowledge Senator Waters' question, but I also say that this government, and I think those opposite, will not be politicising no. the no. events of last week. As the Minister, Finance Minister said, in his statement uh, earlier in, before question time, the Commonwealth has made the largest contribution to addressing violence against women and their children in the fourth action plan with a $340 million contribution. It covers a range of factors. It covers improving and building on frontline services. It covers prevention strategies to help eradicate domestic and family violence in our homes our workplaces, our communities and our clubs. It covers support and prevention measures for at-sea communities funded under the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, Money to provide, funding to provide safe places for people impacted by domestic and family violence, funding for 1800 Respect, funding for dedicated men's support workers in family advocacy and support services locations, funding to better support former partners of veterans who are impacted by domestic violence and a number of other measures that will contribute to improved safety in women and girls. Funding of $1.2 billion over three years from the Commonwealth for legal assistance services, including 
delivering that through a new single mechanism that allows for a more collaborative, innovative, effective legal assistance sector to address the legal needs of the most vulnerable. Yeah. $10 million for practical on-the-ground improvements to online safety for Australian children and their families. Mr President, there is more that I could add, particularly in relation to the National Implementation Plan, but I also want to say that the recognition that goes across government at the Commonwealth level but also at the state and territory levels is that the complexity of this challenge, the complexity of the problem that we are Order. dealing with is Senator much Payne, more than time about funding. The answer has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The National Road Toll serves to draw the public's attention to the ongoing epidemic of deaths on our roads and to change behaviour. The number of women killed by violence is a statistic that also should be published widely to draw attention to this national crisis and help deter it. Destroy the Joint, a volunteer-run project, does it. Why hasn't the government established a close to real-time national government-run toll to track the national crisis? If a small organisation can make credible data available within days, Order. why is the Senator government Waters. so slow to act? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I know that this is a uh, a matter that Senator Waters has raised uh, previously. Our commitment as a government uh, is to preventing, addressing and ultimately ending this violence. What the Australian Institute of Criminology has been doing through over 25 years is reporting through its National Homicide Monitoring Program. It's data which is credibly sourced through our law enforcement, our national coronial information system and other data sources. As appropriate, it provides trend data upon which the government can design policy to prevent these homicides in the future. And I understand the point that uh, the, the matters that Senator Waters raised, but don't necessarily agree with them. The most important thing, from my perspective and from this government's perspective, is to stop to eliminate violence against women and their families. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. This morning, Senator Hanson said on national television that Hannah Clark's ex-husband, and I won't name him, was driven to it and that these things happen. These aberrant attitudes are offensive and they undermine efforts to prioritise children's safety in the family law system. Will this government now accept that Senator Hanson's attitude puts women and children at risk and will you remove her? as Deputy Chair of the Family Law Inquiry. Senator Payne. Mr President, uh, there are a range of issues to uh, address in that question, but the most important one, I think, uh, relates more broadly at a national level to use of language. We have to speak, write, report more accurately and empathetically about domestic violence. It's uh, a matter that Senator Rustin and I raised in our statement last week. Uh, we have to think more carefully about our expectations of healthy, respectful relationships. And I said, as I said in answer uh, to Senator Askew's question uh, earlier in question time, language does matter. Order. It Senator, does matter. Se Senator Waters on a point of order. Yes, thank you, uh, President. Relevance. We know language matters. My question was whether you are going to remove Senator Hanson as deputy chair of the Family that, Law Inquiry. Senator Waters, that was part of your question. The minister is being directly relevant to the, another part of your question. Senator Payne to continue. Thank you very much. Just to conclude, Mr President, I said it in my response to uh, Senator Askew. Uh, we cannot tolerate public language that, dis that trivialises or distorts the reality of domestic violence. Each murder, each act of domestic violence is an individual atrocity. Order. Senator Payne. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Liberal member for North Sydney, Trent Zimmerman, says that transitioning to net zero emissions by 2050, and I quote, is something that we should be looking very seriously at. Not only will this not be a disaster, there will be opportunity. Is Mr Zimmerman correct? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, the member for North Sydney is, of course, entitled to his views, but let me tell you what the government's position is. The government's position is that we will continue to make decisions 
that are environmentally effective and economically responsible. Now, what we will not do uh, is take the reckless approach of the Labour Party, which, delay, which the Australian people rejected the last election, and that is make, make, un, make, meaningless, make meaningless promises without a plan, without a costing, without any information to the Australian people on what the impact on the economy, on jobs, on living standards, uh, and indeed on global emissions uh, are going to be. Because I mean, we, of, the Australian people actually understand this very well. Imposing burdens in Australia on Australian business, which just lead to shifting emissions to other parts of the world where emissions will be higher for the same level of uh, economic output, is not helping to address climate change. It is imposing a sacrifice uh, here in Australia, here in Australia, uh, for not actually helping the environment. And I would have thought that out of all people, Senator Kitchen uh, would have known about this, given that she is a senior member of the Otis Group. Of the Otis Group. We, of course, we know that there is an opportunity for bipartisan policy in relation to climate change and energy. Uh, Senator Farrell leading the rebellion. Uh, Joel Fitzgibbon leading the rebellion. And in fact, I think, I think we've got Jim Chalmers. He's being very quiet about this zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, proposition from the leader of the opposition. Here, here we have, here we have, uh, Mr. Mr. Albanese has uh, shortened 2.0, uh, working with Mark Butler, who, for some reason, uh, escaped the blame for this terrible policy disaster at the last election, where poor old Mr. Bowen uh, was, uh, you know, moved on from. Uh, the shadow treasurer's position. Well, I'm, I'm quite surprised that uh, Senator Kitchen would be asking me these questions. I would have thought that Senator Kitchen would be supportive of our commitment to pursue policies that are environmentally effective and economically responsible. Order, Senator, order, Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Let me try this MP, Mr. President. The Liberal member for McKellar, Jason Falinski, tweeted yesterday, and I quote. Cutting emissions is one of the most serious economic and environmental challenges and opportunities we collectively face. My focus is on developing an achievable roadmap which will get us to a point of net zero emissions by 2050, 2050? or earlier. Is, yeah. is Mr Falinski correct? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, I can tell you what the government's view is when it comes to emissions uh, reductions, and that is that we have committed to a 26 to 28 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030, which represents a 50 per cent reduction on a per capita basis, a two-thirds reduction uh, on an emissions intensity basis. Uh, what, what is Labor's what is Labor's commitment or uh, emissions reduction target for 2030? You seem to have run for the hills when it comes to your 2030 emissions reduction target. I guess, oh, we're in government, Senator Wong says. We're in, well, you know what? We were always open and upfront about our commitments and what we wouldn't be prepared to do. And we are not prepared. We are not prepared to just put some meaningless statements out without doing our homework first. We will ensure that the decisions we Order. make are environmentally effective and economically responsible. That is, of course, why we are still, that is one of the key reasons why we are still in government and why you are still in opposition. Order. Senator Kitching, a sup final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr question. President. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian told the New South Wales Parliament that net zero emissions by 2050, and I quote, is our target and it is right in line with the Paris Agreement. Ah. Is Premier Berejiklian correct? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. We, we will make decisions in the national interest around a policy agenda that is environmentally effective, environmentally effective and economically responsible. And let me tell you, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Uh, the Australian economy, we in Australia, we are a net exporter of energy. We are net exporter of energy sources. And you know what? Our energy supplies, our energy supplies like LNG, black coal, uh, and others uh, can help reduce emissions by more. And if we are not careful in terms of the decisions that we make here, and if we don't properly calibrate the decisions when it comes to emissions in Australia, we might actually, we could be doing harm to the global environment. We could be doing harm to the global environment. And that is, unlike, that is why, unlike the Labour Party, why, unlike Mr Albanese and Mr Butler, who are pursuing an extremist, reckless and irresponsible approach when it comes to these issues, we will continue to make reasonable, responsible decisions focused on being environmentally Order. effective and economically responsible. Order. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Minister, it's reported 78,442 people are infected with the coronavirus, 
of which 2,456 have died. Based on those figures, the mortality rate appears to be a little over 3.1 per cent. In comparison to the Spanish flu, where the World Health Organization believed 2 to 3 per cent of those infected died, the coronavirus appears to be a deadlier pandemic. While I commend the Morrison government on closing the borders to Chinese travellers for the past few weeks, I'm at pains to understand why Australian universities are able to put profits before the health security of this nation. Will the minister guarantee the health of Australians and put an end to universities circumventing our nation's flu-stopping Chinese travel ban? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Hanson for the question. And Senator Hanson, I am going to have to reject the premise of your question. Uh, the government's advice is very, very clear. Students who have been outside mainland China for the last 14 days may be able to enter Australia, provided the student does not return to China on the way to Australia. The government is not actively <laughs> suggesting that students travel to a third country for 14 days because of the changing epidemiology of this disease. The rapidly evolving situation, combined with changes to travel restrictions by other countries, could mean students could get stuck in a third country. Our advice to international students is that they should monitor the advice on the Department of Health and Department of Home Affairs websites. Students should also check with their airline and education providers before making decisions to travel to Australia, including via a third country. They should also check any current travel restrictions for other countries before travelling. I do acknowledge, Senator Hanson, that you have the commended the government on the action uh, that we have taken to date. Um, and as the Minister for Health and the Prime Minister have stated, uh, Australia is ready and our government is working constantly to keep Australians safe. Australia, as you have acknowledged, was one of the first countries in the world to declare coronavirus as a disease of pandemic potential on the 21st of January, and this was more than a week before the World Health Organisation. In terms of the decisions that the Australian government takes, as I have reiterated to uh, the Senate, these decisions are Order, underpinned Senator by Cash. medical advice. Time. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. Given Royal Darwin Hospital cannot deal with coronavirus cases and patients being sent back to their home states for treatment in capital cities, can the minister list for me the hospitals in regional Queensland that can treat the virus should it break out in my home state? Senator Cash. Thank you. And again, Senator Hanson, I'm going to have to reject the premise of your question. Uh, the decisions that the Australian government have taken are underpinned, as I've stated to the Senate on a number of occasions, by medical advice and recommendations from the Commonwealth's chief medical officer and chief medical officers from each state and territory on the steps necessary to contain the spread of the corona virus. In terms of the advice from the chief medical officer, uh, the chief medical officer has confirmed that our arrangements to protect Australians from coronavirus are working. There are no confirmed cases among Australian citizens and residents who have returned to Australia since the introduction of the border measures on 1 February 2020. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. There has been a lot of talk with regards to the containment of the coronavirus. Minister, are we past the point of containment of the coronavirus in Australia? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, and again, I'll refer to my previous answer. The Chief Medical Officer has confirmed that our arrangements to protect Australians from coronavirus are working. There are no confirmed cases among Australian citizens and residents who have returned to Australia since the introduction of the border measures on 1 February 2020. Our health experts have advised 
that the situation with coronavirus in mainland China uh, has not improved in the past two weeks. And as such, you would be aware that we continue to require Australian citizens, permanent residents and their families who have been in mainland China from 1 February 2020 and to return to Australia to self-isolate for 14 days from the time they left mainland China. But I would reiterate our decisions are underpinned by medical advice and Order. recommendations Senator from the Cash. Time for the answer has expired. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Here, here. Can the minister update the Senate on the latest employment figures for January and how the Morrison government is delivering on the commitments it made at the last election, including to reveal real outcomes to support Australians into work? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. I thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Uh, and Senator McGrath and I had the opportunity last Thursday of attending a jobs fair in Caboolture. Um, where the labour force figures were actually uh, when they came out. And, uh, Mr President, it, it has been acknowledged uh, that it was a difficult January. Uh, and certainly, despite this and against market expectations, uh, we saw last week in January 2020 the creation of over 46,000 full-time jobs. That was against market expectations, and we saw a net increase of 13 and a half thousand jobs. Mr President, what this means is that over the year to January 2020, we have seen employment increase by almost a quarter of a million jobs. We now have a record number of Australians in employment. Just under 13 million Australians are now in work. That is a record high, Mr President. We also have a record number of Australians in full-time work. Additionally, we continue to see a record number of women in employment. We have record female participation. And I'm pleased two-thirds of all new jobs for women are actually full-time jobs. Mr President, again in January we saw an increase in the participation rate. What does this mean? This means that Australians are putting up their hands and they are saying they have confidence in the jobs market and they are ready, willing and able to work. Mr President, since we were elected to office in 2013, the policies that the coalition government have put in place have now supported the economy in creating now over 1.5 million jobs. We will continue to put in place policies that enable job creation in Order. Australia. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. What opportunities is the government providing to ensure that Australians who want to work can get to work? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, Senator McGrath and I had the opportunity to join uh, the member for Longman, Terry Young, uh, last week, and uh, have a jobs fair in Caboolture. As you know, the government uh, will take jobs fairs around Australia, and we've had almost 29,000 job seekers attending to date. In terms of last Thursday, we had over 2,000 people come through the door. They were people who were actively searching for work locally in Caboolture, but they were also people who were coming there to talk to job service providers about the services that are available to them. So, for example, how to update your resume or how to sit down and actually undertake an interview. We had over 700 specific jobs on offer with over 40 exhibitors talking to potential employees. Mr President, this is all about ensuring that people who are actively looking for work are connected with the pathways to employers locally who are looking for employees. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate of the policy priorities of the government to continue to support <laughs> jobs growth in Australia? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, we know that governments themselves don't create jobs. That's something that employers do. What governments do is put in place policies that enable 
in this case, businesses to prosper, to grow and create more jobs for Australians. And as I've said, since we were elected to office in 2013, we've put in place policies that have now enabled the economy, employers out there, hard-working employers, to create in excess of 1.5 million jobs. Mr President, how are we doing this? Well, in the first instance, we are lowering taxes, whether it be for small businesses so they can reinvest back into their business, grow their business and create more jobs for Australians, or alternatively, lowering taxes for working Australians. Because we believe that Australians should be able to keep more of what they earn. We're also reducing the costs of doing business through deregulation. We're enabling better access to finance and we're ensuring that small businesses are paid on time. And we're building the infrastructure our economy Order. needs Senator to grow. Cash. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. At the National Press Club on 29 January, the Prime Minister said about the country sports infrastructure program, and I quote, It's important to note that the Auditor General did not find there were any ineligible projects that were funded under this scheme. The Auditor General contradicted the Prime Minister in evidence to the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants, saying, and I quote, no, that's not what we found. Good on you, Eric. Uh, Order. Why, why is Prime Minister Morrison misrepresenting the audit office and misleading Australians? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister was doing nothing of the sort. The Prime Minister was quoting. The Order. Prime Minister was quoting uh, the INO's own report, which highlights at page nine that no applications assessed as ineligible were awarded grant funding, and that point was reiterated by the INIO during the committee hearing. And I'm referring you directly uh, to a question asked by Senator Canavan, answered by Mr. Brian Boyd. Senator Canavan, and I'm quoting, was there a project that received funding that was assessed as ineligible by Sports Australia? The INIO, Brian Boyd, no. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. The ANAO revealed in evidence to the Select Committee that 43 per cent of the projects, 290 in total, were in fact considered ineligible when the agreements were signed. How then can the Prime Minister claim, as he did on the Sunrise uh, program in January, that, and I quote, every single one of the projects that was approved was eligible, every single rule was followed? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer the Senator to my previous answer. Order. Order. I will call Senator Farrell when I can hear him. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes, I do, I do have one. Thank you, uh, you Mr. Him? President. <laughs> why is Prime Minister Morrison being loose with the truth? When, he was, uh, when, he, uh, uh, when will he correct the record and start being honest with Australians about the actions and those of his ministers? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question. As I've already indicated in uh, response to the first question, uh, all the Prime Minister did was uh, quote and reference the INIO's own report, and I refer the Honourable Senator to uh, my first answer. Order. Senator Davey. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are seeking to change the way welfare recipients report their employment income to make the process simpler? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, uh, Senator Davey, for your question uh, and your ongoing interest in managing our social security system. We are absolutely committed to making sure that our social security system is accurate, fair and simple for the people who need it. As part of this commitment, the government is introducing legislation that will be making it simpler for welfare recipients who report their income to do so and will improve the accuracy of the payment system. At the moment, 1.2 million Australians will report that they returned an income other than their, their earnings that they receive or the money that they receive through their income support payments. Um, and those 1.2 million people are required to report that to the Department of Social Services um, every fortnight. Currently, they actually have to undertake quite a complex calculation uh, to report uh, their partners or their own incomes over that fortnight. 
Um, and this can be particularly um, difficult uh, for people who uh, might work shift work or casual work. Uh, and so, Senator, um, Senator and this can often lead to misreporting, both underestimating and overestimating what people earn. So what the proposal of this legislation is proposing to do is, instead of people having to do through that complex calculation, we are seeking for them to actually report what they earned, what they actually received, what they were paid, what they were paid, not for them to seek to have to make a calculation to estimate what they earned. What we're doing here is, is to make sure that reporting of income is actually as it currently occurs and welfare recipients will report income as it's paid as opposed to when it's earned. And so by changing the way the employment income is put, it simplifies this process for Order. recipients. What we're doing is we're taking the guesswork out of the process. Sen Senator Davy, a supplementary question. Thank you. And Minister, uh, how will the payment pro recipients benefit from this new technology that's being embedded into the reporting process? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, recipients uh, will be benefit from this by a number of ways, but most particularly, uh, in addition to the change of assessment model, which the legislation is due to come before this place this week, um, it will also um, assist with the uh, application and integration with the single-touch payroll data system, which means that welfare recipients uh, can now have their employment and income details pre-filed, similar to that that occurs on your tax returns. Um, and so through the advances that we've seen through the ATO, this will allow the information that employers report um, as part of the system uh, every fortnight will actually go to populate the Centrelink forms, which can be used as a prompt for recipients when they're filing their, uh, their fortnightly returns. The recipient will still be required to validate their form so they are, are still able to make changes if they believe the information contained in the pre-populated form may be inaccurate. But what it will do is it will assist to make sure that we are not seeing under Order. or over estimating. Senator Rusty, Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, can the minister please advise us why it is so important to make income reporting simpler and easier for welfare recipients? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, people who currently receive payments such as New Start, Youth Allowance, and, and other so social security payments need to report any income that they've earned over a fortnight. They can either do it online, they can use a mobile app, over the phone, or they can visit a Centrelink centre. Uh, but the way they report their income, as it's paid as opposed to as it's earned, will be much simpler and easier. In any given fortnight, 550,000 Australians will report that they have some form of income. By simplifying the system, it will make a huge difference to these hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and it means that payment recipients will have greater certainty Order. about what they're going to get each and every fortnight. And if we can help people make sure that they get paid the correct amount each fortnight, then we reduce the likelihood of receiving an overpayment. And this is particularly important to ensure the sustainability of our welfare system into the future and giving confidence to their recipients. Senator Carr. Um, Mr President, my question without notice is the Minister representing the Minister for Cities and Urban Infrastructure, Senator Cash. And I ask, can the Minister confirm that the Urban Congestion Fund will provide funding for project in every Liberal seat in Melbourne, including $240 million for the seat of Higgins, while the seats of Gellibrand, Layla and Maribyrnong in Melbourne's west will receive nothing? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator Carr for the question. And Senator Carr, you would be aware uh, that the Urban Congestion Fund uh, projects will be funded in Labor seats. Uh, this is a four billion dollar fund, as you know, and it is all about bringing to life 166 crucial projects. Seventy of them will actually start construction this year. Four are already underway, with geotechnical investigations and other preparatory work underway on many more. And as the Minister for Finance has stated, Senator Carr, order. Senator Carr, on a point of order. On relevance, uh, Mr. President, I ask specific questions about seats in Melbourne, not the general program. Seats in Melbourne. Um, I didn't catch 
every word in the question. I did, I knew, I've let you remind the minister of that part of the question. I believe, and I'm happy to be corrected, there was an earlier part that asked the minister to confirm funding about seats more generally as well. Well, I've allowed you, the minister, to, to I've allowed you to remind the minister of the question, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, what I can confirm, Senator Carr, is uh, these are election commitments made by the government. Uh, you may have forgotten, but the Australian people voted in May of last year to re-elect the coalition government, and as a result, uh, these decisions of the government are now being implemented. What I can confirm, Mr. President, in relation to Victoria is is the following $70 million for Northern Lines commuter car parking in the seats of Colwall and McEwen, $50 million for upgrades on the Calder Freeway and the M80 Ring Road, Gorton and McEwen, $50 million for upgrades on the Hume Freeway and the M80 Ring Road, again in the seat of McEwen. $50 million for upgrades order. on the Western Senator, Freeway. Order, Senator Cash. I've got Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Senator uh, Gallagher on a point of order. Similar to Senator Carr's point of order. order. Can I hear the point of order, please? It's, it's, Senator Gallagher. Uh, it's the same point that Senator Carr made. Um, the question was actually quite specific and named a number of seats. The minister is deliberately avoiding answering the question that was asked. It was not a general question. It was, a, no, it was drafted specifically, and the minister should be specific. Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. On the point of order, uh, the uh, question also included uh, a number of assertions and accusations, and the minister is directly relevant in uh, responding to those. Senator Wong on the point of order. On the point of order, the only assertions contained in the question, which we're happy for the minister to respond to, were that there is $240 million for the seat of Higgins, nothing for Jellybrand, Law or Maribyrnong. That's a pretty reasonable set of facts for the minister to respond to. She hasn't responded to them. Direct relevance, right, Mr President. So I'd ask you to call it an order. I, I have taken some advice from the clerk, because I admitted a second ago this is not a question I managed to get notes of. Um, you reminded the minister of the question. I do believe that if asked a question about seats in Melbourne receiving funding under this program, it is directly relevant for a minister to be able to answer that by asserting other seats in that same location were part of the program. But I am listening carefully to the question as I appreciate it was specifically asked. Um, you have reminded the minister of the, uh, of the um, specific nature of the question and I call her to continue keeping that in mind. Senator Cash. Well, me. Mr. President, as I was saying, we are actually providing funding, urban convention funding, in Labor seats in Victoria. $50 million for upgrades on the Western Freeway and the M80 Ring Road in the seats of Fraser and Gordon. Again, uh, Mr. President, um, we took these projects to the election last year in May, and the Australian people endorsed the plan of action that the coalition government took to the election. I do Order, note, Senator though, Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Carr, thank a supplementary you, uh, question. Thank you, Mr President. I'd ask, can the minister confirm that in the seats of Deakin and Latrobe, which they will receive $400 million from the Urban Congestion Fund, and the seats of Cooper and Wills in Melbourne's inner north will receive nothing? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, uh, this, these are decisions Order. of government. They are not competitive grants. It is a fundamental difference between what those on the opposition side of the chamber keep on yelling out compared to what they actually are. Again, you may not like it. But these were commitments that we took to the election, just like you took commitments to the election, Labor's election commitments. Every single election commitment that Labor made, that I believe that we're aware of, were in Labor or target seats. The fact of the matter is you still cannot get over the fact that the Australian people endorsed the plan of action that we took to the election. They endorsed the plan of action that does see funding go Order. to Labor seats. They endorsed the Senator. plan of action. They endorsed the plan of action that takes into account a number of factors. And it is taxpayers' money Order. and it is Senator being Cash. expended. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Carr, a final supplementary question. Well, 
Order. I'd like to hear Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister's just confirmed that this was not a competitive grants program, can the minister explain how it is that this government has allocated $5 million for a regional roads in Bellarine Peninsula to fix urban congestion in Karangamite, but nothing for the seats of Ballarat and Bendigo, which of course have been sizeable population growths? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, this is a $4 billion fund, and guess what? The Australian people voted for it, and guess what? It is bringing to life 166 order. crucial projects. Order. Senator Carr on a point of order. Does this now mean that you have to vote Liberal to get money order. from this government? Um, order. That, 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 order. That wasn't a point of order. Senator Wong on a point of order. I'll take Senator Abetz's interjection that that would be a good well, idea. I, I, I take that order. interjection, Senator Abetz. I, I, interjections and responses to them are always disorderly. I did not hear. Order. I call. I call order. I'll call Senator Cash to continue when I can hear her. Order. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I completely reject Senator Carr's characterisation of the funding of these projects. We took this plan to the Australian people. The Australian people looked at our plan Order. and they said we trust the coalition government to implement an urban congestion fund that is actually going to make a difference where it counts. What they said to Labor was in relation to Labor's election commitments is we don't trust you in relation to the commitments that you have made including Thompson's Road Extension, $65 million, Senator Carr, in La Trobe, a Order. seat that you were targeting. Queensland, Rochdale Road, Priestdale Road upgrade, $14 million in the electorate of Bonner. Mr President, the fact of the matter is this was a plan endorsed by the Australian people that is vital to busting Senator congestion Cash, time for the in answer Australia. Has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the status of the no novel coronavirus and what further precautions the government is taking to protect Australians from this virus? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Van for his question. Um, as at 6:30 a.m. today, the 24th of February, there have been a total of 22 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Australia. Ten are reported to have recovered, with the remaining cases understood to be in a stable condition. The case totals by jurisdiction are two in South Australia, five in Queensland, four in Victoria four in New South Wales and seven cases associated with the Diamond Princess repatriation flight from Japan. Minister Hunt and his state and territory counterparts attended the Australian Health Protection Principles Committee meeting on 23 February and were given an update on the current COVID-19 situation and discussed national preparedness of the health system. The advice received is that COVID-19, or coronavirus uh, as it is known, has been contained in Australia with no new cases in the general population in the last week. Although the virus is contained in Australia with only 22 cases, Australia is ready and has acted very early to prepare for a potential pandemic. The containment of the virus in Australia is an encouraging indication that the government's approach to prevent the spread of coronavirus on our shores continues to be successful. Of the Australians who have been contained or who have been on the Diamond Princess and have been brought to the quarantine facility in Howard Springs, seven have been diagnosed with coronavirus. All are well and in stable condition, but have been put into an isolation and containment process before being medevaced to hospitals in their home states. The protection and safety of Australians remains the government's highest priority. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the spread of the virus and how Australia's health system is working to minimise the risk of further transmission of this disease? Senator Cash. Uh, Mr. President, while the travel restrictions remain, the Australian Health Protection Principles Committee has recommended that current containment measures receive continual review. 
As a consequence of the positive signs of containment, the committee has recommended that Border Force extend case-by-case -case exemptions to the travel bans to year 11 and 12 secondary students in, uh, from mainland China, excluding Hubei. The government have considered and accepted that advice. There will now be a limited number of exemptions granted. These exemptions will be provided on a double green light basis. This means where both the Commonwealth and the relevant state and territory health authorities agree, students from mainland China have a pathway to return to Australia and continue their studies. We will continue to consider developments in China and advice from the committee as they meet and review health and travel Order. arrangements Senator on an Van, ongoing basis. Final supplementary question. Can the minister tell us what steps the government is taking to minimise the impact of coronavirus on the broader community? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Last Thursday, the government decided it remained necessary to continue the travel ban restrictions on foreign nationals entering Australia for a further week to the 29th of February. This means that for a further week, foreign nationals, excluding permanent residents who have been in mainland China, will not be allowed to enter Australia for 14 days from the time they left mainland China. The extension of exemptions to Year 11 and 12 students will not substantially change these arrangements. Australian citizens and permanent residents will still be able to enter, as will their immediate family members. We continue to require Australian citizens, permanent residents and their families who have been in mainland China from 1 February 2020 and who returned to Australia to self-isolate for 14 days from the time they left mainland China. Again, our number one priority as a government is protecting Order. Australia Senator Cash, and time Australians. For Senator Cormann. Uh, I ask for the questions to be placed in an order space. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Wong. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senators Rustin and Cormann in response to questions asked by Senators McAllister and Kitching. Ms. Madam Deputy President, we have to do better. This parliament has been locked in the same battle for 10 long wasted years. Actions have consequences, but so too does failure to act. Neglect has consequences, and we've seen, we can see that already. We've seen it this summer. We see it in so many reports about what is happening around our world. And we know that these consequences, the consequences of climate change, will only get more ser serious. To keep the planet safe, we have to achieve less than two degrees of, close, of global warming and as close as possible to 1.5. And to do that, the world must achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Now, this isn't a radical proposition. It's a proposition supported by the Business Council, AGL, Santos, BHP, Amcor, BP, West Farmers, Telstra and many others. It's a proposition which has been adopted by 73 other countries, many with conservative governments. Australia must pull our weight. We have to get to our zero emissions ourselves. And the reason is we have so much to lose and so much to gain. As Ross Garneau says, Australia has the strongest interest amongst developed countries in the success of the global effort on climate change. Now, let's put a dollar figure on it. Melbourne University has told us that the cost to Australia of not getting to zero net emissions is $2.7 trillion. That is 20 times the cost of acting. Professor Garneau has, already, has also said we have the most to gain economically from being part of the global transition to a zero emissions economy. And the CSIRO said last year that reducing emissions to net zero by 2050 will deliver stronger economic growth, higher wages and lower energy bills. Better, stronger growth, higher wages, lower energy costs. Not from the Labor Party, but from the CSIRO. But instead of dealing with the facts, instead of a responsible debate based on facts, for the last decade we have had a fear campaign based on falsehood. And I have watched in this chamber as Barnaby Joyce many years ago, whilst he was in this chamber, helped destroy the bipartisan consensus with the coalition, helped move the Liberal Party from a sensible moderate position to a position determined by those on the hard right. 
and we have had a decade of inaction as a consequence. And Deputy President, the political class, the media, the business community, those with the direct capacity to influence and determine our country's response to this profound crisis, I think should take a leaf from the Australian people themselves. Because the determination and the cooperation shown by Australians when dealing with the bushfires is the determination and cooperation in this place that we should be showing to address the drivers of bushfires. You see, we have to change our political culture. We must end the climate wars. We need to stop the nonsense that action on climate is radical. It is not. We cannot indulge the fiction that the many who want action are outliers. We are not. The outliers are those who don't accept that we need to get to zero net emissions by 2050. Right. You see, as I said, we once had consensus on climate action in this country across the parties of government before some decided they could make political gain by creating fear. And we see the same battleground again, the same gotcha questions, the same tired debate. You know, I think that so many of these gotcha questions are about distorting the debate in favour of doing nothing. And they're part of the political problem because they polarise the community and cruel the chances of building enough consensus to act. How about we look at the cost of not acting, both in terms of the cost to our economy, the cost to our way of life and the cost of lost opportunity. And each of us needs to ask ourselves whether we're helping or harming in this debate. Because there are many people inside the Liberal Party and in the community who recognise that this is not a radical position, who recognise that this is something we need to deal with <coughs> responsibly, who recognise this is something we should deal with, the, with on the basis of evidence and facts and make rational policy decisions about. Yeah. I say to those office opposite, there's a reason Tony Abbott is no longer in the parliament. It's because people who voted for you understood that ultimately his and the position that many of you hold is irrational. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, there is one thing which the Leader of the Opposition said in this debate in her contribution which I agree to, and that is the argument should be based on evidence and the facts. She refers, the Leader of the Opposition refers to the gotcha question. What is the gotcha question? The question is, what will your policy cost? That's the gotcha question. It's not an unreasonable question. That's the question you could not answer people in my home state of Queensland. That is the question you could not answer workers in the Boyne Island smelter. That is the question you could uh, answer people working in the beef industry in Western Queensland. That is your gotcha question, Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. How much will it cost? How will you achieve it? What does it mean to the voters of Queensland? What will it do to electricity prices? These are your gotcha questions. The gotcha questions. The gotcha questions. You still can't answer them. All you've done is kick the can 20 years down the road. 20 years down the road from 2030 to 2050, when none of us will be in this place. 2030 to 2050, when no one here would be accountable for the decisions, the policy direction you've taken. And you call these gotcha questions? These aren't gotcha questions. These are questions which working families in Queensland have a right to have answers to. They have a right to know what it means for their communities, what it means for their jobs, what it means, what it means for the people of Queensland. They have a right. They have a right to answers to those questions. In the last federal election, the Labor Party achieved its worst result in my home state of Queensland since the 1940s. Since the 1940s, you returned one senator out of six. One out of six. I know. Well, you may well know it, but I query whether or not you remember it, because you've just rolled out exactly the same policy. Even worse. Even worse, without a roadmap, you talk about evidence and facts, and yet there's no evidence and facts supporting your policy to move to net zero emissions by 2050. Let me give you one example. Even New Zealand, even New Zealand was, proposes to largely exempt the agricultural sector 
from the net zero emissions goal, which the New Zealand government legislated. Even New Zealand agreed to do that. But when we saw the Leader of the Opposition, we saw the Leader of the Opposition in another train wreck of an interview on Insiders yesterday, he said, no, it applies to agriculture, it applies to transport, it applies across the board. And his answer to transport, I think, just showed how disconnected, how disconnected he is from everyday people in Queensland. He said, well, they can catch public transport. Catch public transport. If you're, offer, if you're operating a beef cattle station in Western Queensland, you can't just catch public transport. I'm sorry, it's not the inner city suburbs of Sydney, it's not the inner city suburbs of Melbourne, and it's not the inner city suburbs of Adelaide. People in regional Queensland have a right to, the, to an answer to responsible questions. And one of those questions is, what is your policy going to cost? What will it mean to those regional communities in my home state of Queensland which rely upon export exposed industries? Anthony Albanese in his interview on the insiders also said, well yeah, Australia will keep will keep exporting thermal coal in twenty fifty? Probably, absolutely. Why not? And with that export thermal coal will go the jobs. Just as we've seen Blue Scope Steel set up a steel mill in Ohio because electricity prices here in Australia are too high, just, just as we've seen Incitec pivot set up an ammonium nitrate plant in Louisiana because electricity prices <coughs> here are too high, just as we've seen the owners of Boyne Island Smelter in my home state of Queensland, of Tomago Aluminium Smelter in New South Wales, of Portland Smelter in, in Victoria, just as we've seen the owners of those smelters say electricity prices in this country are too high now. They're too high now. They're too high now. It is Order. nonsense. Order. Our policy, our policy is Order. clear. We will achieve. We will achieve. Order. We will Senator achieve Wong. the treaty obligations which we entered to Senator in Paris. We will achieve. We will achieve those obligations. Sometimes I wonder if those opposite this side of the chamber are actually standing up and fighting for the people of Australia or whether or not they're representing other people. They're certainly not representing the people of my home state of Queensland. Certainly not representing the people in my home state of Queensland. Um, Senator Wong? I paused hoping the Leader and the Government would show some honour, but I don't know what the Senator was just implying about me or anybody else on this side, yeah. but perhaps he could clarify. Well, it's not a point of order, Senator Wong. It is a debating point, and I believe Senator Scar sat down. Have you finished your contribution? Okay. So, S Senator Scar has finished. Order. I, I think we're up to the next speaker. You, Senator Keneally. Yeah, President, what a contribution from Senator Scar. How did he end that contribution, questioning the <coughs> motives? of those who sit on this side of the chamber. He raised a spectre of racism, quite frankly, and he is unwilling to clarify to this chamber— uh, Senator Keneally, Senator Ke order. I'm going to hear the point of order. Order. Senator Scard, you have a point of order? Madam Deputy President, that is a personal reflection on me. Playing the racist uh, card, playing the racist Senator card in Scar, such a situation Senator is a disgrace. Scar, a disgrace. Senator Scar, order. Senator Keneally, resume your seat. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Scar, when I ask you to resume your seat, please do so. Senator Keneally, please continue. Madam Deputy President, I would be happy if Senator Scar would like to stand up here in the chamber and clarify what he meant then. Senator Wong gave him the opportunity to Senator clarify Keneally. what he meant by saying that those on this side of the Senator chamber were not representing the interests of Australian people but someone else. Who did he mean? Who did he mean? Well, there he sits silent. There he sits silent. He could have said and he has not done so. So let's return to the matter at hand, the taking note on the questions posed during question time regarding net zero emissions and this government's failure to work collaboratively with the Australian community, with every state and territory government, with the Business Council of Australia, with the National Farmers Federation, with the biggest companies in this country to commit ourselves 
to what we've already committed to, the Paris Agreement, that is to keep global warming at less than two degrees, that is to net zero emissions by 2050. Australia ratified that, treatment, that treaty. Malcolm Turnbull, Julie Bishop, and Josh Frydenberg, on behalf of this third term, seventh year Liberal National Government, ratified the Paris Agreement. And to quote Gladys Berejiklian, the Liberal Premier of New South Wales, net zero emissions by 2050 is right in line with the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. It is extraordinary that this is even controversial. What Labor announced last week is not controversial. It is the common sense, well accepted, endorsed proposition of 73 countries. It's been ratified already by this Australian parliament, by this liberal and national Australian government. It's been endorsed by all those businesses I spoke about earlier, by every state and territory, including three liberal state governments. The fact that this is somehow radical or unusual is just bizarre, given that this is actually the commitment the globe has made. This is the commitment the globe has made and Australia has ratified. Now, climate change is real. Australians this summer devastatingly and unfortunately smelt it, felt it, breathed it in. Tragically, 33 people lost their lives. 3,000 homes were lost, nearly a billion wildlife. Our native animals lost. That's the cost of climate change. And Australians experienced it in a very real and devastating way. This weekend, I was at the New South Wales state memorial service for the victims of the bushfires. It was somber and sad. It was extraordinary to see that this is what this country has come to, that in New South Wales we have had the most devastating natural disaster in living memory. And this side of the, the parliament, the government, this liberal national government, seems unwilling to recognize that the climate is changing and we have already signed up to a target to keep global warming to less than two degrees. A target that is not, is not all that controversial. Let's talk about the impact on agriculture because this is one question that Senator Rustin really failed to grapple with. The National Farmers Federation have a more ambitious aspiration than the Labor Party when it comes to net zero emissions. They want net zero emissions for agriculture by 2030. The meat and livestock of Australia have committed to be carbon neutral by 2030. Farmers for Climate Action support net zero by 2050. The reality is Australian businesses are moving in this direction. Australian farmers are moving in this direction. Australian state and territory governments are moving in this direction because they know to do otherwise will bring great economic cost, lost opportunity, a failure to grow economically, a failure to create new jobs, a failure to see ourselves become a renewable energy superpower. It's as if the other side were present at the uh, invention of the automobile and decided we should all still stay in horses and buggies to keep the buggy manufacturers going. We know that this country is going to have to face climate change, change and adapt, and that's what this target drives us to do. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy, Pre Madam Deputy President. The Labor Party clearly has not learned the lesson of the last election. The Labor Party and the Greens trumpeted the last election as the climate change election at which the Australian people would be able to determine whether or not they accepted the Labor Green view of the world or the coalition view. Can I remind honourable senators opposite that the people of Australia very wisely adopted the coalition policy in relation to climate change on May the 18th? They spoke. The quiet Australian spoke. And let me be very clear. The Australian people made a very common sense decision. They asked two quest or one question. What is the pain to gain ratio? What is the pain going to be on my power bill, on jobs, on Australian wealth, in exchange for any potential benefit to the world environment? And Mr Shorten and the Australian Labor Party were unable to answer either part of that question 
of the pain to gain ratio. What we do know, and what Senator Scar so uh, very eloquently put to Senator Wong, who then of course had to use the racist car to try to overcome it, everybody knew what Senator Scar was referring to, that the Australian Labor Party has deserted the Australian worker in favour of inner city greens. And that is where the Labor Party is in a cleft stick. They do not Order. know whether they support coal mining. So you had Mr Shorten during the election going up to Queensland Order. saying he supports coal mining and then in Victoria saying, well, I'm not sure I really support Adani. Order. Guess what? The Australian people didn't believe you and for very good reason. And look, Senator Wong and Senator Keneally can refer to the experts time and time again. Well, I've been listening to the experts now for 30 years telling me there's going to be a tipping point in 10 years' time. Well, after 30 years, the Australian people have a right to ask why is it that these predictions over 30 years have failed to materialise? Why is it when experts assert quite loudly and blandly, Professor Tim Flannery, by the way, that the Brisbane River would never flood again. It's flooded once, it's flooded twice since. Have they ever been brought to account for those false prophecies? No. Similarly, they have asserted that the Murray River would never flow out to sea again. Yes, it has. Another false prophecy. But yet we're supposed to rely on these experts without any question. The Australian people are more clever than the Australian Labor Party and their inner city green friends would think. And indeed, Senator Keneally just referred to the bushfires. Well, today we have an opinion poll which tells us that the Australian people are smarter than Senator Keneally and the Labor Party. There was 56 per cent of the Australian people acknowledge that the bushfire problem that we had this year was not as a result of climate change, but as a result of the failure of fuel reduction oh, within Senator our bush. Senator Abetz, please resume your seat. Yes, Point Senator of order. Would like to tell us all the other results of today's opinion um, polls. I'm more than happy to Keneally, give you time that's to a do debating so. Point, not a point of order. Senator Abetz, please continue. The authority of the Australian Labor Party in these sort of debates, when you've got them skewered, what do they do? Raise these frivolous points of order to try to distract people from the issues where the Australian Labor Party is so out of step with the Australian people. Now, we as a government are very clear. We believe that technology is the way to go, and that is why in my home state of Tasmania, with Hydro 2.0, that is a great example of government investing. But similarly, can I say it's a great idea for the federal government to also invest in a feasibility study for a coal-fired power station in North Queensland. The two are not incompatible. Indeed, if we would have spent just a very small fraction of the money spent on renewables on retrofitting our coal-fired power stations in Australia, we could have more energy and a 30 per cent reduction in our emissions, if only we could have done that with the taxpayer money. And look, when other countries are referred to, what's the biggest industry in New Zealand? Agriculture. And what have they done? They've said, we will commit to an emissions target, but guess what? Out of the side of their mouth, we won't be including agriculture in that. Oh, really? Let's get a sense of reality. The Australian people are smarter. That's why they voted for us on May the 18th. Thank you, Senator Abbott. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, it's all on display this afternoon, isn't it? Because uh, Senator Rustin and Senator Cormann tried to run something approximating the line of a government that was maybe a little bit committed to acting on climate change. But then Senator Scar and Senator Abetz just got up and let the cat out of the bag, didn't they? Because Senator Scar would prefer just to complain bitterly about the idea that any target might be set at all while simultaneously being concerned that the target that's been set doesn't have enough detail attached to it. A reasonably inconsistent internal position, I'd suggest. And then Senator Abetz has put the position that what we ought to have done over the last uh, 30 years was spend all of our time investing in yesterday's technology and ignoring the technology that all of the global investment community tells us is the future, and that is renewable energy. And it goes to the heart of the division in the government, and it explains, if anyone needs an explanation, 
why it is that for seven years this government has been completely unable to formulate an energy policy of any kind. Not an emissions intensity scheme, not a clean energy target, not a national energy guarantee, not any of the other mechanisms that have been floated and discarded, floated and discarded in the chaos of their party room. Because the sad truth is this, that this is a group of people desperately torn between the siren call of populist denialism on display this afternoon and sensible evidence-based policy. They are torn between crude oppositionalism and the responsibilities of government. And they are increasingly landing on the wrong side of that divide. They're lured in by the culture warriors to the detriment of people they would ordinarily call allies. Imagine what the business community makes of all this. Imagine the captains of industry whose position on this has been clear for a long time. A net zero emissions by 2050 target, consistent with the science, has been endorsed by the Business Council of Australia, by the CSIRO, by the Australian Academy of Science, by the Property Council of Australia, by AI Group, by the Grattan Institute, by BHP Qantas, the Commonwealth Bank, Telstra, AGL Origin and Energy Australia. What did they make of all this nonsense here in this chamber? What did they make of a group of people who'd rather stoke wars on Twitter than actually get on with governing? What do they make of this? You have to ask what state colleagues make of this. What does poor old Ms Berejiklian in my state, the Premier, think about this? That state committed to net zero emissions by 2050, something, words that cannot be said by either Senator Rustin or Senator Cormann in their answers this afternoon. Obviously, Mr Falinski and Mr Sharma find it all pretty embarrassing. They're willing to go on the record and say that Australia should get with the program, get with the international community's program to actually tackle this problem, which represents an existential threat, a threat to our biodiversity, a threat to our way of life and a threat to our economy. Because all that gets served up is fear. Mr Littleproud is out this morning talking about a dra dramatic reduction in the national herd. Mr Joyce is upstairs ranting in the corridors of the press gallery about shrubs and manure. Mr O'Dowd also talking about manure, but in less parliamentary terms. All of them apparently trying to engage on the question of emissions reduction in the agricultural sector. Well, it's not the approach taken by the National Farmers Federation. We've got a roadmap, net zero by 2030. They're embracing the future with optimism. They're looking at the opportunities. They're making concrete plans for the future. Because that's actually what leadership looks like. That's what government requires. It would, amongst other things, require you to have an energy policy because that is where the big gains are for Australia. Gains are there for consumers because if we had an energy policy, we'd have lower prices, we'd have lower emissions, and we'd actually have an investment boom that drove jobs and opportunities in regional Australia. It's very clear that the only way that we are going to resolve this is to elect a Labor government. There is no other party of government with the capacity or the drive to actually engage seriously Thank with this you, question. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Your time has expired. Do you wish to speak on the same matter, Senator Hanson? So it was questions um, by uh, Labor senators to Senators Cormann and Rustin. I wish to speak to a question from Senator Larissa Waters. OK, so resume your seat and I'll call you next. I'll just move this part of the debate. So if you resume your seat, I'll call you. I have to move a motion on where we're up to in the Senate now. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson. Senator Waters. So I'm on my feet, thanks. And since it was the question that I asked, I'm seeking the call. Uh, I, I gave I the call to seniority. Senator Hanson, Senator Waters. Well, I believe I have seniority in the chamber. Senator Hanson. Uh, beg your pardon, Senator Waters. I've given the call to Senator Hanson. She was on her feet. Please resume your seat. Senator Waters. 
I'm not asking you to debate with me. I've ruled. I've given the call to Senator Hanson. Uh, I would suggest if there's an issue around this part of the business, you raise it at the WHIPS meetings, which is what I've suggested to people before. I'm going to the person who was on her feet, and that's Senator Hanson. Senator Waters, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> Today, a question was put by Senator Larissa Waters. This Sorry, morning, beg Sen your pardon, <clears throat> Senator Hanson. Yes. It's a question to the government that arises out of question time. So, well, it was. I so have to, it, to which the, minister? So it's a question from Senator Waters to from which, Senator Payne. The question that was put to Senator okay, Payne. Thank you. Okay, the question that was put to Senator Payne by Senator Waters this morning. I preface it by saying this morning Senator Hanson said on national television that Hannah Clark's ex-husband, and I won't name him, was driven to it. Driven to it. And that these things happen. These abhorrent attitudes are offensive and they undermine efforts to prioritise children's safety in the family law system. Will this government not accept that Senator Hanson's attitude puts women at risk, and will you remove her as deputy chair of the Family Law Inquiry? I did go on um, national television this morning, and I'd like to state what was said. For a week we've been in the news nearly every day about this horrific tragedy, and we don't hear much about it when a woman has murdered her children by driving a car into a tree. She threw out a suicide note or the woman that actually doused her husband with fuel and set him alight and then said she was possibly driven to it. A lot of people—these are my words—a lot of people are driven to do these acts for one reason or another. Hopefully the family law inquiry will get to the bottom of it. But don't bastardise all men out there, or women for that matter because these things happen. Let's get to the bottom of it, why it is happening, and hopefully find the answers so it never happens again. They were my words, and I had never said that he was driven to it. And I seek an apology from Senator Waters for her comments um, today in this chamber. I have no intentions of stepping aside from being the deputy chair in this family law inquiry an inquiry that I feel that I've got some great committee members working with me and the chair, um, MP Kevin Andrews. I think it's very important that we have this inquiry. It's a voice for the people to have their say. We need to get to the bottom of it. We know we've got a broken family law system. We need to hear what the people have to say. We will never stop the murders, the murders of innocent children or women or men taking their lives unless we find the reasons behind this. You can't sugarcoat it. You can't just ignore what is actually happening. And you can't blame one group or, not, or another. I know this. And you needn't actually say, think that I don't ha have any idea what domestic violence is. You have no idea of my previous life and what I've been through. To sit here and say that you need, you need me off the committee well, the fact is that my being on the committee, because I was the one that has driven to have this family law inquiry. What have the rest of you ever done? How many years has, uh, has Senator Walters been in this place? What have you ever done about it to really care about the women that have been murdered or the children that have been murdered? And this is why we def definitely need the family law inquiry to get to the bottom of it, so people can get on with their lives and not destroy each other's lives or innocent children. I have been absolutely horrified and distressed and over those innocent children's lives being taken and their mother. So I would like an apology from Senator Waters for her comments today, or I want them withdrawn because they were not said by me and it's misleading this chamber and the people of Australia. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. With a minute and four seconds um, available to me, I rise to take note of the answers given to my question um, by Senator Payne on behalf of the Attorney General. I asked her where the money was for frontline services to protect women and, ch and children fleeing violence. Her answer was that that was a politicisation of this issue. 
It was kind of a bit ironic that she then went on to detail the funding that she says the government is in fact providing, but that wasn't politicisation. But in any event, that funding is absolutely pitiful. It's minuscule. It's not what's required. We know that a good $5 billion and a 10-year funding commitment is what's required. Um, but apparently it's all too complex. The minister said the issue is just too complex. It can't just be fixed with funding. Well, it would be a good start if crisis support services didn't have to turn women and children away because they don't have the resources to help them when they reach out for that help. The beds are full. Some of the phone calls can't be answered because there's simply not enough resources. The government could fix this today, and they should do so. So the question is that motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.